Welcome to this episode on understanding impermanence. Impermanence is a concept that I've been wanting to share with you for a long time, and now it's finally the time to do it. Impermanence is a fundamental teaching of Buddhism and Hinduism. I want to introduce you to this concept and this term, because I'll be referencing it again and again in the future, because it's very fundamental to living a quality life. And it's a concept which unfortunately isn't very well understood in the West. So, in Pali, the language Pali, uh, which, uh, of course, is Buddhist, related to Buddhism, they have a term called anicca, anicca, which means impermanence. And literally, you can break that word down into its two components, a, which means non, and nicca, or nika, which means constant. So. Anicca is non-constant or impermanence. But then there's also a parallel word from Sanskrit, which is more connected with Hinduism, and the term there is anitya, anitya, which also means something like non-constant. Of course, these are just Eastern traditions, Buddhism and Hinduism. Uh, don't think that this this concept of impermanence is only coming from these two traditions. This really this concept is a spiritual concept that comes from and is present in most of the world's spiritual traditions, whether East or West. Although, of course, in Western traditions, oftentimes some of these concepts become very corrupt or they get relegated to the sidelines as as these religions become about power more so than about transcending the self. So what's so important about this concept? Impermanence simply means that all form is non-constant. It's always arising and passing away. And by this term or word form, um, just to be clear what form is, form literally means everything. Form is a more broad word even than object. So when I say object, you think of a car, a tree, a human, a dog, etc. That encompasses a lot of stuff. But the word form is even more broad and universal than that, because usually, for example, when we say object, you don't think of a, of a thought or an emotion or a feeling or something nebulous like that as being an object. Object is, is a rather materialistic term, whereas the word form encompasses feelings, emotions, and all sorts of nebulous, non-material type stuff that is also a part of reality. So, form is everything. So what we're saying here is that no single form can be frozen in reality. It's a question of time, how long a form will stick around, but they always pass away. There's always a moment of arising and a moment of passing away. And this is true of all forms. Now this seems almost like a truism. You might say, well, okay, Leo, sure, you're probably right, sounds right, but so what? This seems like such a simplistic truth that it can't really help me in my life. Well, that's why we have to spend an hour or two talking about impermanence, giving you all sorts of examples and convincing you of just how powerful this, this idea is. And then also we're going to have to give you some homework assignments to actually practice impermanence to be able to see the power of this concept. But it does, it does benefit us to spend some time just thinking about why reality is impermanent at an existential sort of level. What is so special about impermanence? Why must reality be structured this way and not some other way? And the reason that is, is because God is a shapeshifter. God is a shapeshifter. But here I'm introducing the concept of God we have to be careful because there's a lot of misconceptions that people have about God. So make sure you don't fall into the trap of thinking that I'm introducing you to some sort of religious or ideological notion of God. I'm not. 
I'm talking just about your true nature. I'm talking about the entire universe. When I say the word God, I mean this present experience you're having right now and the universe as a whole. For more on that, go check out my two-part series called What is God? where I explain it all in a, in a simple, rational way, and I answer a lot of questions and objections that people commonly have, a lot of misconceptions and myths around what God is. God is you. God is that thing sitting there right now listening to me. That's God. And God is me sitting here speaking to you. <laughs> God is everything. God is consciousness. This is all consciousness. Everything you think is physical is actually consciousness. But as I talked about in my episode called Aztec Non-Duality, remember that one where I talk about Teotl? Teotl is just another word for God. The Aztec word for God. So in that episode, which is one of my best ones, go check it out. It's a really good one. I put a lot of uh, work into the research of it with a lot of quotations and so forth. It's a beautiful description of non-duality and spirituality and God from the Aztec perspective. In that episode, I talk about how Teotl is a shapeshifter. Well, we're coming back to that idea. That's a very powerful idea. Most people, when they think about God, they think about God as a static object, some bearded man in the clouds. But that fundamentally misunderstands what God is. God is a shapeshifter. And of course, by that, what I'm saying is that you are a shapeshifter. And of course, I'm also saying that the universe itself is a shapeshifter. Reality itself as a whole is a shapeshifter. Right now, you are that God, which itself has no form. God is totally formless, but it takes on different forms as a shapeshifter. And right now, it happens to be taking on the form of that human creature sitting there right now listening to me or sitting here right now speaking to you. So, the nature of a shapeshifter, though, is that it doesn't have any form. It's like the invisible man who can take on and put on different disguises. The disguises don't define him because he can just take it off, put on another one. So, this is why reality is fundamentally impermanent, because consciousness, which is what God is, consciousness is empty and takes on different forms. And the reason that is, is because consciousness is infinite. Go check out my episode, two-part series, Understanding Absolute Infinity, if you want to understand what infinite means, really. When I say infinite, I don't just mean it's big in size. I'm not just talking about its length and depth and breadth, its physical dimensions. I mean infinite, infinite, actually infinite, infinite consciousness. You can't really know what that is unless you have some deep awakenings. But anyways, consciousness is an infinite, and because it's infinite, it's trying to maximize its diversity and love. It's trying to maximize its creative output. That's what infinity is. It's an infinite expression of creativity. For it to do that, for it to be everything, for it to be unlimited, God must constantly keep changing forms. In the same way that a TV screen, fundamentally, the function of a television screen is not to display one image. It's to be flexible enough to display any possible image. And in a sense, if a TV screen ever displayed only one constant image, then it would be a dysfunctional TV screen. It would be a bad TV screen because you want to be able to like flip the channels on a TV screen. You want to be able to see any picture, right? But what that means is that the TV screen itself must be unattached to any particular picture. Can you imagine if you were like flipping through the channels and then your TV screen had a mind of its own and it clung to one particular image, like you were flipping through the channel and you got to some porn channel <laughs> and the TV screen was like, oh, I like this porn. And then it gets stuck on that image and it only displays that one image that it loves. It pulls one image out from, from all the porn you watch, and then that's the thing it displays. Well, you would say that this is, this is a malfunctioning <laughs> TV screen, you see, because you want to be able to flip to other channels. Sure, the porn is, is fine, it's nice, but then after you're done watching it, you want to be able to switch to something else. 
except now it's getting stuck. If it gets stuck, it gets limited. You see, if God got stuck on one particular form, then all of its attention would go to that form, and then it wouldn't be as diverse and as infinitely loving and creative as it could be if it kept moving on. But to move on, it has to let go of the thing that it created. See? So in a sense, God is like a blank canvas on which all of reality is drawn, but then it has to be wiped clean. You might almost think of it like one of those etch-a-sketches, you know, those little sand drawy thing where you, you turn the knobs and it draws on the sand and then you can shake it side to side and then it clears the whole thing and then you can draw again. That's the nature of reality. Now, by the way, I want to point out that this, this notion that the only constant thing in reality is change itself is a very powerful idea of that notion I introduced to you in the past in my episode called The Theme of Things Going Full Circle, where I t give you a bunch of examples of, of ways in which these sort of dualities like constant versus change, how these dualities collapse and ultimately circle back around into each other. See, If you go through so much change that it's infinite change, eventually that infinite change is the one constant of the universe. The universe is a perpetual motion machine. Actually, not in theory, not a science fiction, but the universe as a whole I'm not saying that a part of the universe is a perpetual motion machine. That seems to be impossible given conservation of energy and various other physical laws that we know of. But when you take the universe as a whole, that consciousness or God, that itself is an actual perpetual motion machine. It's always in motion, forever, to infinity. But if the universe wasn't a perpetual motion machine, then it would get stuck and get bugged out, sort of like a computer or like that TV screen that we were talking about. The trick, though, is noticing this and accepting this. It's difficult for living organisms and humans who are selfish to accept that this is how the universe works. It's difficult for limited beings to accept impermanence because impermanence is an unlimited, infinite quality. And so, Humans, what we like to do, because we're selfish, is we want to make that TV screen or that computer get stuck according to our self-biased needs. Go check out my episode on self-bias to understand what that concept means. It's an important one that we need to leverage here. So, here's a good way to explain it. Imagine you have a daughter, and you love your daughter very much. She's beautiful to you and perfect in every way. And now imagine that you were given the power to freeze her forever, as she is. You were able to make her immortal. She could live forever. Nothing could ever harm her. She could never suffer. She would exist for a billion years. You just had to push this one red button. If you push it, she's going to become immortal. And she's going to stay in her current form. She's not going to grow. She's not going to grow old. Her teeth are not going to fall out. Her breasts are not going to sag. It's, she's just going to stay exactly as she is right now, perfect and beautiful as you love her. All you have to do is push that button. So the question I have for you is, would you push that button? And of course, most egos would push that button. Because that's what attachment is. You're attached to that particular form. Of reality. You don't want your daughter to change. You don't want her to grow old and to die and to have diseases and to get saggy skin and have all sorts of other problems. You want her to stay as perfect as you want her to be. But that's you being selfish and myopic, you see. When you're thinking this way, you're only thinking about that one part of reality and you're ignoring everything else. You're not considering how pushing that button would affect other human beings, how it would affect the universe as a whole. See, because you're biased, you're only thinking of her as your daughter. 
You're not thinking about other human beings. You don't see how pushing this button would hurt the rest of creation, would diminish the rest of creation, because you don't care. Your responsibility is not to the whole of creation. Your responsibility as a parent is just to that little, itty little bitty, tiny piece of reality that you've identified with and taken responsibility for. But see, God, as the intelligence which is running the entire universe, can't think this way. It can't be self-biased and selfish like you. It has to take into consideration everybody else as well. And as much as you think that you love your daughter, and that the reason you're doing this and pushing this button is because you love your daughter more than anybody else in the world, actually, you're deluding yourself. Because God actually loves your daughter more than you. And it's actually because God loves your daughter more than you that God will not allow you to freeze her. Because to freeze her would be detrimental to her and to the whole of the universe. Because you see, while you are attached to her being in her current form, what God understands is that this daughter of yours is actually God itself, is the entire universe. So to lock God into that one limited form, because God is a shapeshifter, you confining her to that one form would actually be the greatest evil you could perpetrate upon your own daughter. Because if she was locked into that form, that means she would stay that way forever. That means she could never die. That means she could never awaken to her true infinite nature as a shapeshifter. She would be stuck in that one particular form in the same way that if I locked my TV screen to one particular image, I would ruin that TV. See? But if I love that one particular image so much, you can see how I might be tempted to be able to lock that screen into that image forever, like burn it in there permanently. See? So here it's very counterintuitive because it seems to most parents, for example, if their child dies or something bad happens to their child, it seems to most parents that, oh my God, why would God be so cruel and allow my child to go through all this, you know, to, to grow up and to get abused and to, to face the evils of the world and then to have cancer and then to die? Why would God allow all this? But the reason you're confused is because your vision is too narrow. You're too attached to your child. But you trick yourself into thinking that actually you love your child so much. No. Your love for your child is extremely limited. If you fully loved your child the way that God loves your child, you would let her go. See, that would be true love. Love is a very radical and counterintuitive thing. Go check out my two-part series, What is Love? Part one and part two, where I explain some of this stuff. So actually, God loves your daughter more than you, and that's precisely why your daughter must be impermanent and your job in this life is to surrender enough of your own self so that you're not so attached and so limited with your self-biased perspective that you take on the perspective of God and you realize that, ah, to really love my daughter as much as God loves my daughter, I would have to let her go. And I would have to appreciate her impermanence. Of course, not just her impermanence, but the impermanence of everything, and including my own, my own physical body as well. So, ironically, clinging to your daughter is a limited form of love, whereas letting her go is the unlimited form of love. See, unlimited love is a very radical thing because it doesn't cling it loves indiscriminately. See, the problem is that you love your daughter only under certain circumstances. You love her when she's beautiful. You love her when she's not sick. You love her when she's not abused. You love her when she's not dead. But God loves her under all conditions. And of course, 
what God wants the most for her is for her to go through all of the possible incarnations and to experience the infinity of what she is. You see, but this is such a radical thing that, of course, it involves suffering and pain and disease and death and aging and rebirth and all this, which is a lot for a parent to accept. It's a lot for an individual to accept. You can't accept it in your own life. So therefore, of course, you fear the same for your daughter. You project all of your personal fears onto your daughter. You teach all of your personal fears onto your daughter. You've taught your own daughter that death is evil. That's what you've done in your own ignorance because you don't know any better. Because you don't know that you're God. Yeah, it's very counterintuitive stuff. So it might seem like the loss of beautiful and good things is evidence of evil in the universe or is evidence somehow of God's imperfection. Like, for example, some, you know, some fundamentalist religious preacher might lose his daughter to cancer and then he might have a, a, a crisis of faith where he starts to question his Christianity, for example. And he starts to question whether God is even real because, you know, if God was real, how could God allow for this, my daughter to die of cancer? But what he's not understanding is that that, <laughs> that death of the daughter by cancer is the very evidence of God's perfection and love. Loss is not contrary to the perfection and goodness of the universe. Loss is evidence of absolute love. You just need to really understand what absolute love is. You need to radically recontextualize what loss means. And of course, that's impermanence. So this is why this concept is so important, you see, because whether you realize it right now or not, as you go through your life, you're going to face all sorts of crises and problems, diseases, health, uh, dysfunctions, evils of various kinds, and you're going to have to face them one way or another. Even if you're a scientifically minded person, even if you don't believe in God and you don't believe in spirituality and think it's all nonsense, you're still going to have to somehow explain evil to yourself and to your loved ones because you're going to encounter evil in the world, whether you like it or not, whether you're, you're scientifically minded or not. You might even be so scientific that you might even say to me, well, Leo, evil doesn't really exist. But see, that is your explanation to yourself of evil, is you say it doesn't exist. But see, it's one thing to just, in the abstract, say that, oh, well, evil doesn't exist. But what happens when it actually happens to you? You might not ideologically believe in evil, but when evil is done to you, some great horror is done to you, like you have cancer in your life, or someone close to you dies, or suffers greatly, or whatever. One of these sorts of things. Maybe somebody robs you of a bunch of money. Somebody behaves unjustly towards you, attacks you viciously, violently, smears your name, whatever. If one of these happens to you, you're going to feel very upset by that. See, it's going to disturb you greatly. It's going to affect the quality of your life. It might even lead to an existential crisis for you. See? So, rather than waiting for that to happen and to be able to, and in effect, reacting in a sort of a knee-jerk, unconscious way when this evil happens to you, what I'm proposing is that you actually train yourself to properly understand what evil is by understanding impermanence. Really, most of the things that you call evil are just examples of impermanence. You perceive it as evil because you've attached yourself to one particular form and you want to freeze that form and you want reality to just stay like that forever. But the truth is that everything is in constant motion. So you had no right to expect 
that thing to stay frozen, whether it's your daughter or your bank account or your wife or your husband or your career or whatever. And the reason you attach yourself to these different things and you try to freeze different parts of reality is because that's literally what survival is about. Check out my, um, my series on understanding survival. It's a very important episode. See, true love is so deep that it cannot cling to any one particular thing because it loves all things equally. How are you going to choose? You see that by loving your daughter, you're limiting your love such that all of your attention goes to your daughter, but then what about all of the other daughters in the world? Why don't you love them? See? God can't just worry about your one daughter. God has to worry about all living beings in every possible universe, across all time. You see? <laughs> so, the considerations that God has for how to design the universe and what needs to happen and all that, it has to take in far, far more than what serves your personal, little, egoic needs and your agenda. Sometimes what that means is that your daughter will have to die from cancer. For the greater good of the universe, but of course, that doesn't, that doesn't soothe you, that doesn't console you when you're a parent and you're attached to your daughter. Because you don't want to sacrifice your daughter for the greater good of the whole universe. You want her to live. And so, of course, then you blame God and you say, Oh, God, how could you? You're not, you're not good and you're not perfect because you weren't able to save my daughter from some terrible evil like cancer. Uh, because supposedly, hey, you know, Leo, if God is infinite, shouldn't God be able to construct a universe where nobody dies of cancer? See, that's the kind of logic that an ego takes because it doesn't see the bigger picture of things. You know, this reminds me of a, of a story. When I was young, when I was about 10 years old or so, I really loved animals. I mean, I still love animals, but I was really into it. I, like, I, I wanted to get every animal as a pet. Uh, pet rabbits and snakes and fish and cats and birds. I've had a bunch of different kinds of animals throughout my life. Uh, but at that point, I was really into rabbits. And there was this pet store that we would always go to by my house. And there was a pen of rabbits there all the time, you know, like most pet stores have. Rabbits are like the cheapest pet. <laughs> and there was like usually 20 rabbits or so in this kind of open pen with straw in there and shavings and stuff. And you can just pet them. It wasn't a cage. It was just like a pen with an open top. And I would always, my mom would take me there and I would go with her and I would like run in there and I'd be so excited to, to pet all the rabbits. And my thing was, I don't know why it got in my mind, but like I felt bad that all the rabbits didn't receive the same love and attention. Like I saw that some people would be petting like the, the prettiest rabbit or the cutest rabbit, but then ignoring the other ones. And I felt like, well, if these rabbits are sitting in this cage, essentially the whole day, like the one consolation they get is like, they get petted. So to, to me, it was like, well, petting them is like, is what they want. So I, in my mind, I thought of it as like, all the rabbits need to be petted equally with no one rabbit getting extra special love or attention. And so like when my mom would be petting one rabbit, I would force her, I would tell her, no, we, if you pet that one, you have to pet all the other 20 ones. And so every time we would go in there, I would force her to pet every single rabbit in the pen and not leave anyone like unloved, <laughs> unpetted. And I would do the same thing. And of course, now, you know, after all my conscious work, now what I realize is that what I was doing there is I was literally trying to embody, unwittingly embody God's unconditional love. That's the difference between loving, you know, in a sort of a narrow way versus loving in a kind of a broad, universal way. Now, of course, this can also become dysfunctional um, when, you know, you, you try to love everybody. Uh, in the end, the problem is that, is, you know, it's very hard for a mere mortal, a limited uh, human being to love everybody and everything equally. Really, only God can do that. You have to be totally formless and infinite to be able to do that. But luckily, you are God. 
and you are formless and infinite, so you are able to do it, but only when you're in that state of consciousness, not in your usual state of consciousness that you're in, like right now, not in your dualistic human form. So, here's a key insight for you. Devilry occurs when you try to make the impermanent permanent. Go check out my episode, What is the Devil?, where I talk about that. Devilry is a self-biased clinging to reality. So by definition, what the devil does is try to freeze reality in different ways. So one of the challenges of the design and architecture of the entire universe, which is the brilliance of God's design, is that God has to arbitrate and mediate between all the different devils that exist, the different partitions of God that exist, and somehow make sure that they all function in some sort of harmonious way. Because if every devil got his choice, then, for example, if every parent was able to freeze their child in one particular form, then what would happen? Seven billion people on this planet would all push that red button, all the parents would turn all their children into these frozen forms that could be immortal, that would be immortal and would never die, and therefore all of the human race would come to a stop. Human evolution would come to a stop. Societal evolution would come to a stop because the evolution of society depends on human beings being born and dying and new generations arising. If you froze everybody in place, This would be a net negative for the whole universe. See, So it seems good in the short term, but it would be terrible in the long run. Which is why it can't be done. Ta-da! See? God doesn't really allow you the power to be a devil forever. You can only be a devil for a short while. Devilry is temporary. Only God is permanent. A devil is what God becomes when it limits itself into a particular finite shape or form. And the reason we call it devilry is because once you've attached yourself to one particular finite limited form, that form then goes into survival mode and manipulates, lies, cheats, steals, and does all sorts of quote-unquote evil to maintain that form. So by pushing that red button, you are accepting the devil's bargain and thereby committing the very evil that you wish to protect your daughter from. See? Because you see, the death of your daughter frees up all those atoms and molecules all that energy that is in your daughter's body, it frees all that up to create new life. This is the cycle of life. If every human body was frozen to maintain its current configuration, that means that energy and those molecules and that matter couldn't be used to feed the worms, which grows the grass. That grass grows the cows and other animals and the birds. And then those birds are eaten by humans and this whole cycle continues and new life evolves. And then, you know, we have apes and then from apes, we've got humans evolving and then beyond humans, we'll have something else evolving, right? This whole chain of evolution, the cycle of life, it's, it's always continuing. But if you, if you froze it, imagine what would happen if some species froze itself a billion years ago. when it was in a very primitive form, then there couldn't be more beautiful creatures. There couldn't be tigers and lions, and there couldn't be dinosaurs, and there couldn't be apes, and ultimately there couldn't be humans. All of that beauty, all of that creativity would be lost because some species a billion years ago pushed that red button and froze itself in its current configuration because it was so selfish and it thought that it was already at its best form. Why do you think your daughter right now is at her best form? 
Are you thinking a million years into the future of what your daughter will become after a thousand incarnations when she turns into some other species on some other planet? No, of course not. You're not thinking about any of this because you're completely locked into this very myopic, limited human perspective. You're not even thinking about like the next generation of humans. You're not even thinking about by, by pushing this button, you will take away or rob some future human being of his birth or her birth. Because there's only so much matter on this planet. There can only be so many humans on this planet. So if your daughter takes up one slot, let's say, let's say there's a hundred billion slots for humans on this planet. That's like the carrying capacity of this planet, Earth. Well, if she takes up one of those slots, that means she's stealing that slot from somebody else who could have been born. And of course, so are you. That's the nature of survival. That's the nature of coming into reality as a form. By being a particular form, you're, you're robbing some other form of being in your place. You see that? This is very important. In this case, we're literally talking about um, a zero-sum game. The weird thing about reality is that even though it's infinite, when you're incarnating as a particular form, it's finite and it's a zero-sum game. So for example, for you to have been born a human, that means you couldn't have been born a kangaroo. You couldn't have been born a panda. You couldn't have been born a space alien. You couldn't have been born as some other human. You had to be born as you. To be born as you, that robbed somebody that robbed consciousness of some other possibility. See, appreciate that. Therefore, you have to appreciate that you're going to have to surrender that. You can't make that permanent. And to try to make that permanent is the very definition of devilry. And of course, as a devil, you want nothing more but a way to make it permanent. You want a red button that you can push to keep yourself alive forever as a finite form. But God will not allow you to do that because if he did, that would undermine the infinity of the entire universe and would actually rob you of the greatest gift, which is the realization of your own infinitude. So I want you to contemplate for yourself the following question. Which forms am I trying to freeze in my life? It could be people, animals, things, ideas, stuff about your personal body, your appearance, your own life, your finances, whatever it is. Make a list of the forms you try to freeze and try to identify the ones that you are most attached to freezing because that is literally what is creating evil in the world. If every human stopped trying to freeze different aspects of their life, all evil on earth would be extinguished in one day. So this is a powerful exercise. Of course, don't, don't expect that to happen because nobody wants to do this exercise. Nobody wants to let go of trying to freeze certain things. They want to make exceptions. They want to say, well, okay, Lee, I'll let this go and I'll let that go, but I won't let this, I won't let this thing go. This thing here I need. Right? And that's what makes you a devil. So don't be surprised when there's a bunch of evil in the world because the reason the evil happens is precisely because Everybody makes that kind of exception, just like you did. They say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to let everything go, except I'm not willing to let go of my position of power, or I'm not willing to let go of my money, or I'm not willing to let go of my, of my business. For example, some, you know, some, some oil executive is, is, you know, ruining the environment by, by extracting oil in un environmentally friendly ways. And then you ask him, well, can you let that go for the sake of the environment? And he says, no, I won't let it go. Right? Because that's his baby. That's his daughter. So when we ask you to let your daughter go, what are you going to say? Are you going to say yes or are you going to say no? You're going to say no. You're not going to care about all this theory. You're not going to care about God. You're not going to care about love. 
No, you're a selfish fuck. You're a devil. You're going to say no. And then you wonder why there's so much evil in the world? Look in the mirror. There's your answer. Fundamentally, impermanence happens because of oneness. Impermanence is one of the consequences of oneness, of non-duality. Oneness means that reality is one thing. If reality is one thing, that means that no part of reality can gain an absolute monopoly over any other part because all parts are equally powerful. Not at one moment in time, but across all of time. See, So, for example, right now, there might be some corporation which is extremely powerful because it's in some sort of industry which is doing really well. Maybe Google, you might say, is a very powerful corporation, has billions of dollars, doing really well because online search is a very powerful and valuable thing. And... 21st century society, but there will come a time in the future where Google as a company will die. Because the times will change, the circumstances will change, what used to be important and powerful will no longer be important and powerful, or there will be some better tool, some better way to search the internet, or there will be something even better than the internet, which transcends the internet and makes the, the internet obsolete or makes internet search obsolete or makes Google obsolete. So even though Google might have a, a monopoly on internet search right now, and it might seem like that will never end, it only seems that way because you take a very short time horizon. You're only thinking in terms of decades and maybe centuries. But if you start thinking in terms of, of millennia and even beyond that, you start to see that this form called Google can't persist. It must die. And the reason that is, is that because over time, when you take infinite time, when you look infinitely far into the future, what you see is that all parts of God have the same power. So what the universe is doing is it's like God arm wrestling with himself or playing chess with himself. That's what oneness means. That means that there can't be one part of God which is more powerful than some other part of God. So even though God can't arm wrestle with itself, and sometimes it'll win, you know, sometimes this arm will win, sometimes the other arm will win, um, in the ultimate big picture, it must all balance out. And no one part of God can be all powerful and dominate the other parts. But of course, every part of God is trying to do that, and that is the very me mechanism of devilry. See, devilry is when one part of God tries to overtake all the other parts and to create a monopoly of power. See? But fortunately, this can never happen. But of course, from the part's perspective, when I say fortunately, I'm speaking from God's perspective, from the perspective of the whole, but from the perspective of the part, it's very unfortunate. From your perspective, it's very unfortunate because you call that death. You call that mortality. And for you, mortality seems very unfortunate. For the devil, mortality seems very unfortunate. But from the bigger picture perspective, you want the devil to be mortal. You don't want the devil to be immortal. And that's exactly how the whole thing is designed. At first glance, impermanence will seem depressing and negative to you because you're a devil and you're selfish. But actually, impermanence is a great gift. And that's what I'm trying to open your mind to here, to teach you here. And that's what some of the homework assignments that I'll be giving you will be about, is teaching you the great gift of impermanence. So the way that we reform devils and cure them of their evil and devilry is by showing them that actually impermanence is not something that you fear and resist and manipulate your way uh, to avoid, but something that you embrace. And that's what spirituality boils down to, is to the, 
the embrace of impermanence. Not only does impermanence liberate you in the end and reduce suffering, it also heightens appreciation, love, enjoyment, and beauty of the formed world. Start to notice that the best things in life that you love the most are so good precisely because they're temporary. It's their impermanence that makes you appreciate them so much. Here are some examples. Ice cream, or caviar, or your favorite food. Why is it so good? It's precisely because you have it so rarely. If you ate the same ice cream 10 times a day for a year, you would be so sick of it, you would find it disgusting. If you ate caviar every single day for a year, and it was your only meal, you would find it disgusting very quickly. You know, have you ever ate caviar? I'm talking about real uh, sturgeon black caviar. Really good stuff, the Russian stuff. <laughs> I'm Russian, uh, and I remember times when I was younger, when my dad, he would travel to Russia on business and so forth, and he would come back, and oftentimes he would bring back a big kilogram, a kilo tin. It was about this round and about this tall. So imagine a tin like this of um, just a solid tin of like the best black beluga caviar. This, this shit is expensive. And this was back maybe 15, 20 years ago when it was still legal to import this stuff. Uh, and even then, of course, it was still expensive, but you can get it much cheaper in Russia than you can in the States. Uh, but still, a tin like that would cost, I don't know, four or $500. I think nowadays it's illegal to actually import into the U.S. and Because uh, they have a, a really big problem with poaching and they're endangered. These sturgeons, it's, it's pretty bad in Russia. They're totally overfished. But uh, these tin nowadays, a, t a kilogram tin of beluga black caviar would probably run you definitely over $1,000, maybe $2,000, maybe $5,000. I don't know what it costs now. But that shit is delicious. <laughs> if you've never tried some, you're missing out. It's delicious. So it's, it's, it's worth the price. But, you know, even that, as delicious and rare as that is, the reason it's so delicious, part of the reason that it's so delicious is because you have it so rarely. There were actually um, old... Russian stories of like peasants who used to live on, on like the Volga River. One of the major rivers in Russia is called the Volga. And they have a lot of sturgeons there, or at least they did until they overfished them all. But like 200 years ago, you know, there were peasants who just lived there and there were so many sturgeons back then because they weren't overfished that there were stories of how these peasants, they, they would have nothing to eat except there would be so much sturgeon that they could just fish these sturgeon and they would literally have buckets of caviar for breakfast <laughs> buckets of the best black caviar <laughs> but they would but precisely because they would eat buckets of this caviar every single day they were sick of it to them they want something like <laughs> like meat you know to them meat was a luxury because there was no no meat but there was so much caviar so that's how life works why is childhood so precious and uh and beautiful because it's so fleeting you have fond memories of your childhood hopefully unless you had like some abusive childhood you should have some good memories there and and then you look back on it with fondness and nostalgia precisely because it's impermanent and it's gone now your family you only really appreciate your family due to impermanence Otherwise, you know, if your family is constantly in your life, it actually grinds on your nerves. If you had to live with your mother your whole life, that would be hell. You have to kind of keep a safe distance from your family so that you see them occasionally, but not too often to the point where they get on your nerves and it just becomes too constant. And then, of course, their death, as sad as that is to you, and as much as you would hate to have that happen, ultimately... You need it to happen so that you can appreciate them more. You're only going to really appreciate your parents after they're gone or your children after they're gone. Your pets, same thing. 
you only appreciate them because you can only have that pet for so long. And you know that going into it, there's a, a time limit on your pet. How about video games, movies, films, all forms of entertainment, songs, and so forth? They're only wonderful and exciting and awesome because they're not constant. If you constantly had to watch the same movie all day long for a year, that would be hell. If you had to replay the same video game, if there was only one video game in, in the universe and you had to replay it over and over and over again, let's, let's imagine that the only video game that existed because somebody, some devil pushed that red button was the original Mario game. Super Mario Bros. on the NES. You know that one? The classic one. So let's say that, you know, after that game was invented by the designers at Nintendo, and then, you know, they had a button and they said, okay, this is the only video game that's ever going to exist. We're just going to freeze it like this. We don't want other video games to compete with us. We're going to have a monopoly on video games, and every video game must be a Mario game, and it's going to be this exact Mario game. We're not even going to add any more new levels. We're just going to keep printing this game over and over again on every computer and game system this would be this would be terrible it would destroy the diversity and the flowering and the creativity of the entire domain of video games that you love if you're a gamer same for movies same for books same for everything you see so so from the big picture perspective what god is trying to do is god is trying to maximize the creative diversity of life and it can't do that when one species tries to gain a monopoly over all of life, which is one of the problems that the human species is doing right now, is we're, we're overcrowding the planet to the point where we're killing off species by the hundreds and by the thousands. And this situation can't last. See? Humans can't just be so selfish that we occupy the entire Earth and populate it only with humans. See? After a certain point, of doing that, we would actually start to see the detrimental effects of it, which, of course, we're already starting to see. Something is lost by losing the diversity of life. This, this notion of diversity is a very profound existential component of reality. One that many people who are anti-diversity don't understand and don't appreciate. You know, especially ethnocentric people people who really love their one culture or their one race, you know, like that sort of white supremacist philosophy of like, well, the white race is a superior one and we want to just like purify the nation of any brown people and black people and weird people and whatever. Um, we just want it to be just like pure white Europeanness, the sort of Hitler mentality, you see? That's devilry. Literally, that's devilry. And why was the result of Hitler's philosophy the sort of uh, destruction and evil that we saw? Precisely because his agenda was to freeze that sort of white Aryan identity that he glorified. To freeze that and to, to promote that sort of philosophy around the world. But it couldn't have worked. You see, it couldn't have worked. There was no way that Hitler could have sustained that. Even if Hitler could have won World War II, maybe, let's say, the Germans invented a nuclear bomb before others did, and they had so much military power that they could have just, like, dominated Europe and even America and so forth, it still couldn't have lasted. Eventually, it would have had to collapse from within. Because no monopoly can be maintained. No racial monopoly, no species monopoly, no monopoly of any kind. Because the nature of reality is impermanence. Your own life itself. The reason your life is exciting and juicy and fresh is because it's short. And you realize that you got to make good use of your time. If you were going to live forever, your life would get very boring and stale and it would quickly devolve. See, you wouldn't even know what to do with immortality if you got it. It would make you such a devil.
A kiss, for example, is made so much better by the impermanence of it. You don't want a kiss that lasts forever. Short kiss. Short kiss that leaves you wanting more. That's really what you want. You want to be teased by life. You don't really want all of your desires satisfied. You think you do, but really you don't. You want to be teased so there's always something over the horizon. The next thing to look forward to. Because you only really appreciate differences. You only really appreciate things when they're gone. You appreciate not having a thing and then getting it and then losing it. Like you're poor, then you earn a lot of money, and then you lose that money and you can appreciate that whole cycle. Because when you go from being broke to having some money, that's it's like a huge relief and it's so nice and it's so wonderful. But then if you bask in that wealth for too long, it corrupts you. It turns you into a devil. It makes you complacent and lazy and you don't work hard anymore. You're not creative anymore. So it's nice that you gain your money, but then you lose some of that money so that you, know, you have to work again. You have to be creative again. You have to start a new business. You have to, you know, you have to get off your ass. Otherwise, you're going to turn into some creature like Jabba the Hutt who just sits around and, and stews <laughs> in his own wealth and in his own uh, crapulence, <laughs> in his own um, obesity and all that, in his own luxury. See, and then it actually makes him evil. So train yourself to appreciate the beauty of loss. This is the cycle of, of life. Um, the death of one thing creates room for the life of something else. The only reason you're able to be alive right now is because all the other humans and animals who lived generations before you had died. If they hadn't died, you couldn't be here to be alive. The loss of a beautiful thing only underscores how beautiful that thing was. Which brings us to the Japanese concept of mono no aware, or just aware for short, A W. A-R-E, like aware, but pronounced aware. Here's what Wikipedia says about aware, and here I'm quoting Wikipedia, which is quoting Fiona McDonald. It says, quote, Mono no aware is the ephemeral nature of beauty, the quietly elated bittersweet feeling of having been witness to the dazzling circus of life, knowing that none of it can last it's basically about being both saddened and appreciative of transience and also about the relationship between life and death. And then Wikipedia says, quote, awareness of the transience of all things heightens appreciation of their beauty and evokes a gentle sadness at their passing, end quote. So here, another word for this aware is just melancholy. That melancholy feeling you feel when there's a sort of a loss of something in your life. And this is a very important skill to develop, the ability to be able to enter into melancholy without going into depression or into anger or bitterness or nihilism. See, make that distinction in your mind between the two. Maybe you can think of a time when you experienced some loss in your life, but you didn't take it personally. You didn't get butthurt about it. You didn't cling to it, but you just sort of realized that, yes, it's sad to lose this thing, but it was time for this thing to go. That's melancholy. That's a healthy form of coping with loss. Whereas an unhealthy form is you're so attached to it that you get butthurt about it. You start to cling to it. You want it back. You ruminate and think about, oh, well, if only I could get this thing, I would be happy and I'll never be happy again. And then you get suicidal and blah, 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 blah. For example, I had a, I had a Siamese cat that I got when I was in fourth grade. And I loved, I loved her uh, probably more than, than, I mean, as much as, as you would love a child. Like I, I nurtured her. She was like my baby. I slept with her. <laughs> like uh, I had her for, for 17 years. Um, and then she started getting old. She got sick. Her kidneys stopped functioning properly. 
And eventually she just like, um, it was clear that she was on her last days. And we had to take her to the vet and um, euthanize her. And I remember the moment that I had to do that. And at the uh, on the one hand, it was, it was very sad because it was a 17 year relationship like that I built with her. Literally, I felt like she was my daughter. Um, that was the depth of the connection there. But at the same time, when I took her to the doctor to get euthanized and went through that whole process, as sad as it was, in the back of my mind, I thought like, well, she lived a good life, 17 years, uh, a lot of great experiences, memories. Like, I don't know what more can you ask of in life? She basically had it all. She, she played and we had fun and we cuddled and we slept together and she went outside. She, you know, she hunted for rats and for birds and for this. And she wasn't cooped up in the house all the time. She was outdoors a lot and all this. And she lived through a lot of stuff and all these experiences. She, I mean, she had the full sort of journey, you might say, of life. And so I felt like nothing was really cut short. And that if I was clinging to her and if I was just saying, well, but why can't I just get one more year with her? What if, what if she could have lived to 17 or to 18, to 19, to 20? What if we could have kept her on some sort of medication? And what if we could have made her more like this? See, if I started going down that road, this would have been the road of devilry. And it would have created suffering. Um, whereas I sort of just entered a, a state of melancholy for, for a while. It was a healthy way of coping with the situation. And it's fine. That's what you want to cultivate and develop. That's aware, as the Japanese call it. And you know, another good example of aware is that movie Lost in Translation with Scarlett Johansson and with Bill Murray. A really good movie. I recommend you go check it out because that whole movie, the theme of that movie, the really what makes it so good is it's got this mood to it. It's got this melancholic sort of mood and... I don't know if this was done consciously by the director or not, but it captures that sense of aware. And speaking of loss in translation, that's a really good title uh, for spirituality, because that's what spirituality is all about. That's what life is about. That's what God is all about. God is lost in translation. God is that which you can't put into words. You must experience it for yourself. And aware is a is an important feature of, of God and, of course, of yourself. When we're talking about God, we're just talking about you. So what impermanence means is that you will lose your family. You will lose your fame, your status, your wealth. You will lose your good fortune. You will lose your health. You will lose your youth and your good looks. You will lose your sharp mental faculties if you have them. You will lose your memories. You will lose being the strongest and the best at whatever you're at. You will lose all of your skills and all of your mastery that you've developed throughout life. Every relationship you have will die. Every religion will die. Every corporation will die. Every organization, political party, social movement, and cult will die. Every fad and trend will pass. Every language will die. Every scientific theory will ultimately die. Every spiritual teaching will die and become corrupt. Every book will be lost and forgotten. Every person will be forgotten. Every city and country will die. Every civilization will die. Every culture will die. Every tradition will die. Every species will die and go extinct. Humanity will die and go extinct. Even continents die and go out of existence because they transform into something else. Every physical object will die. Every atom will be destroyed. Every star and planet will die. Even the universe will be extinguished. Every victor will ultimately end up defeated. Every monopoly and concentration of force will be upended and overturned. Every part will be made whole. Every duality will collapse. Every devil will merge back into God. That's what oneness means. That's what impermanence means. Because life and death is a duality. And so the cost of being born is death. That's how it works.
you see. But a lot of people are in denial about this. They spend a lot of time trying to seize on one of these things and to cling to it and to defend it at all costs. Think about especially, for example, religions. Religions tend to be very orthodox oriented and very traditional. And they want to be very rigorous in preserving the original manuscripts, the scriptures, the Bible, the holy book, the teachings of the founder. But the irony is, is that religion itself needs to teach that religion cannot survive as it was at the founding. It will always deviate, splinter, sects will arise, and those sects will become corrupted, and they will die. Spiritual communities will come and go. The religion will be, over thousands of years, bastardized and transmogrified into something totally different than what it was at the founding. It might even turn into the opposite of what it was, which is what we see with Christianity especially, but most other religions, even with Buddhism. Even if you think Buddhism is a good religion, well, which Buddhism are you talking about? There's at least three major branches, but really every one of those has uh, you know, a dozen more sub-branches within it. And you see, the, the desire to cling to one true canonical religion to say, well, you know, Mahayana Buddhism is the best one, and the Vajrayana Buddhism, that's the inferior one, and this other Buddhism, this inferior one, and my particular sect of Mahayana Buddhism, that's the, the one true one, and we're just going to memorize this Buddhism, we're going to write it down, and it's just going to be perfect like this, it's going to be taught in this one, two, three step way, and this will be the one true religion. No, this is delusion, this is devilry. By doing this, you bastardize religion. I was arguing with somebody on my forum about Sadhguru's spiritual school. And this guy was really into Sadhguru, you know, <laughs> the famous YouTube guru. Um, and I, I got nothing against Sadhguru. I like him. He's a smart guy. I think he teaches good stuff overall, as far as I know. Um, but I was telling this guy, don't cling to it because everything's going to die. Everything's going to become corrupt, including Sadhguru's teachings. And he was saying, no, Sadhguru's teachings are the best, the most perfect teachings. They're never going to become corrupt. It's never going to die because Sadhguru forces everybody to memorize all his teachers and students. They have to memorize how to teach it. They have to teach it like by a script and all of this. This preserves the purity of the teaching and it's the best and da 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 da. No, it's not going to stay this way. In fact, the very attempt to try to codify Sadhguru's teachings into some sort of perfect system that you have to memorize, this very mechanism is the very thing that the devil will co-opt in order to corrupt the teaching. See, because by blindly memorizing things, it's very easy for, you know, rewriting a couple of lines, then people just memorize the wrong lines. It's like a game of telephone. You know, oh, for the next 100 years, 200 years, long after Sadhguru is dead, a thousand years will pass. And then people will be memorizing stuff that Sadhguru never even said or taught. Sadhguru will be rolling in his grave at the things that are done and said and practiced in his name. In the same way that Jesus must be. And basically all, all spiritual teachers face this problem. See, that's because their students didn't fully integrate and understand the notion of impermanence. It's not enough just to understand it intellectually. You have to really grasp it at a cellular level. And that's why this whole desire to, to be very strict and formal about your religion or your spirituality, it ain't going to work. You're just clinging. Or, for example, you know, some conservatives, they will cling to a language and they'll say, well, the English language, it has to be this way. There's one proper way to speak English. You don't want to be introducing new words. That's corrupting the language. But the language that we're speaking now, the English language that you hold as the canonical one, where did it come from? It came from a process of evolution. It wasn't just birth that way. Go read some Shakespeare. You'll see the English language in Shakespeare is, is monstrous. You can hardly understand it. So what's the one true language? There isn't one. 
There never will be one. In a thousand years, if the English language still exists, it will be very different than the English language of today. The mistake is trying to preserve the current English language as it is, trying to fix it, trying to freeze it. That's the mistake. Corporations often fall into this trap as, as well. A lot of times there are corporations that were very successful in the past because they were riding some sort of technological trend or wave. But then that technology, that trend played itself out, and now it's in its downward phase. But these corporations, because they're fighting for their survival, basically like a tumor, they just want to keep growing and growing and growing. They don't want to accept that it's time for us to maybe shut our doors, time to accept that this technology wave has passed. And I'm thinking about corporations maybe like Kodak, Polaroid, um, Blockbuster, these sorts of corporations, you know, that went out of business. But they went out of business for good reason, because they had bad business models, because they didn't keep up with the technology. And that's what happens. But the problem becomes is when a corporation tries to cling to its to its business even after it's been shown that the business is dysfunctional. For example, right now we have corporations who are selling cigarettes long after we've discovered that cigarettes cause cancer and are you know ruining people's health and contributing to unconsciousness in society. But these corporations, they still cling to it. Why? Because it's a good return on investment still. Even still, cigarettes are like, last time I checked, it was like an $80 billion market worldwide for cigarettes. Huge market. But see, really, these, these companies, they need to admit to themselves that, you know, guys, at one point, cigarettes were acceptable, but at this point, they're not acceptable. We need to quit. We need to find something new to do. We need a new business. But they, you know, they keep clinging to it. They just keep investing. You know, these cigarette companies, now they're investing in e-cigarettes and vaping and all this. And now, of course, vaping and e-cigarettes, you've seen the news. Now, there's health concerns with that. They seem to be even worse than cigarettes in certain cases. And so now, now the vaping companies, now they're going to be clinging to, for dear life and survival. Because, you know, once you've built up this successful vaping company, you don't want to admit that you're vaping, that your vaping is killing people and is bad for people's lungs and so forth. See? Devilry. This is the very definition of devilry. I want you to notice how you contribute to this, how you do this. See? It's easy to criticize others for clinging to stuff, except when now it's your ass on the line. Notice how much you cling when it's your ass on the line. That's because you're scared. Why are you scared? Because you're attached to your identity. You fear loss of self. Go check out my two-part series on how fear works. Part one, part two. So, foolish people try to cling and freeze reality into certain forms. Wise people make the counterintuitive move. Remember my episode called The Counterintuitive Nature of Life, where I talk about counterintuitive moves? Well, here's one more for you. Add it to the list. One of the biggest counterintuitive moves is to teach yourself to embrace impermanence rather than manipulating your way out of it. Accept that the cost of life is death. Not just at the individual biological level. I'm talking about all levels. We're not just talking about biology here. We're talking about corporations, we're talking about religions, we're talking about ideas and languages. See how it goes way beyond biology? Evolution goes way beyond biology, which the biologists don't fully appreciate. The cost of being a form is that eventually you must change form. And really, that's all that death is, is just a change of form. You're changing into something else. You're not really dying. You're a shapeshifter. You're shifting your shape. You've just deluded yourself by attaching yourself to this one shape that, oh my God, I'm going to die. No, you're not going to die. You're just going to change your fucking shape. Get over it. 
immortality is impossible through attachment to form. This needs to be understood. That's one consequence of impermanence and oneness. It will never be possible. So I'm actually making a very scientific and empirical prediction here when I say this. What I'm saying is that even after a million years of technological development from today, if mankind is still alive a million years from now, just imagine how much amazing technology we will, we will have invented in a million years. There will still not be a method for immortality through technology. But immortality is possible by detachment from form. And for that, you don't need to wait a million years or some fancy technology, some cryo freeze or some genetic modifications or some technological uploading of your brain into some computer or some bullshit like this. You don't need that. All you need to do is you got to surrender everything and realize that your true nature is that of a shapeshifter. This impermanence brings with it good news and bad news. The bad news is that everything good that you gain in life will be lost. But the good news is, is that everything bad that befalls you will also be lost and will not be permanent. Which means that this is your safety valve. See, God created a safety valve into every life. And that safety valve is death. So if you're trapped in life and you're suffering terribly and all this and there's no way to escape it at all, well, the consolation is that it won't last. It's impermanent. But of course, the flip side of that is if you're born into some beautiful life, you're born to be a billionaire with a golden spoon in your mouth and you live in the best part of the world and everything is, is perfect for you, well, that too won't last. One comes with the other. It's two sides of the same coin. And that's a very important consequence I want you to, to remember here. This will help you when you're in very difficult times. Remember that hell and suffering cannot be a permanent state. All suffering must be temporary because it's limited. All suffering is finite. You cannot get stuck in unconsciousness forever. Eventually, all beings must wake up and return to God and to awaken to themselves as God. And this is, this safety valve, is God's love and mercy. That's the intelligence of God's design of the entire universe, is that this safety valve has been built in. The only problem is, is that you're terrified of this safety valve. You've labeled this safety valve the greatest evil. That's the irony of it. You've labeled God's infinite intelligence and, and love and mercy as the greatest evil. Precisely because your mind is limited and can't see the full, infinite perspective of the design. You're too self-biased. You're too attached to see it. And spirituality is about detaching yourself enough, gaining enough elevation and transcending enough self-bias to be able to see it. And it's this which saves you. It's this which makes life beautiful and allows you to appreciate how amazing life is. Without this, life starts to seem evil and terrible and depressing and pointless and cruel. What we're talking about here, in other terms, is attachment. Attachment creates suffering and disappointment. And what the Buddha taught was how to transcend attachment and to liberate yourself. But of course, not only did the Buddha teach this, but every great sage and mystic all around the world, from Christ to Mahavira to the Jews, 
and the yogis in India, all of them taught this. To transcend suffering, you need to realize that nothing in life should be clung to. Your key mistake is that you've mistaken yourself for a human being. That's not what you really are. That's a false identity. Your true identity is that of an infinite shapeshifter. So, what you need to do, if you want to live the good life, is to realize and take back your identity as an infinite shapeshifter. See, when a shapeshifter clings to one shape or one form, it suffers precisely because it's untrue to its identity, to what it is. See, you're like a TV screen that got stuck on one image, and that's why you suffer. And the point of our work here is to get you unstuck, to get you to surrender your human identity, to realize that your human identity, it's there, but it's temporary. It will be lost. You cannot preserve it no matter how much you want to. So you have to let it go. And one thing you should have noticed already in your life, as evidence of what I'm saying, is that your identity has not been constant throughout your life. Your identity has always been changing. In a sense, you've already died many times in your life. If you're 30 years old right now, if you're 40, 50, 60, think back, compare to what you are, I mean, compare what you were when you were 10 years old to, to who you are now. Totally different. Some stuff seems similar, but you can't even remember how different you used to be. We trick ourselves. Our mind tricks us to, to convince us that, well, I didn't really change. I was the same my whole life. No, you changed enormously. Even if you didn't do self-improvement work, even if you didn't do spiritual work, you still changed so much that it's hard to even call you the same person. Your body has changed. Every cell in your body has changed has died and, and been reborn in this time, multiple times. This happens to you at least once or twice a decade. All of, your, all of the cells in your body reincarnate, we might say. Your belief system has changed. Your career has probably changed. Your likes and dislikes have probably changed. See? You're constantly going through this process because you're a shapeshifter. And that process will continue. And then, of course, it'll get more and more radical over time as well, <laughs> especially if you do this work. So while your temporary human identity can be lost, and it will be lost, and it must be lost, your identity as a shapeshifter, as an infinite shapeshifter, that can never be lost. That's the only permanent thing there is impermanence impermanence shape shifting these are just synonyms for the same thing as an infinite shape shifter you are immortal but you have to really it's not enough to hear me say this you can't just take it on as a belief you have to actually become an infinite shape shifter that's what awakening is about and i want to read you a quote here about shape-shifting from Zena Shrek. She says, quote, shape-shifting requires the ability to transcend your attachments, in particular, your ego attachments to identity and who you are. If you can get over your attachment to labeling yourself and your cherishing of your identity, you can be virtually anybody. You can slip in and out of different shells, even different animal forms and deity forms. End quote. And that's exactly how it works. Now, you might wonder, but Leo, isn't impermanence versus permanence itself a duality? So it seems like you're setting up a new duality in this episode between these two. And of course, you're right. Because as I've told you before, in my three-part series about understanding duality, I told you that language is inherently dualistic. The only way I can speak to you or communicate to you or even think 
is by creating dualities. So of course, when I'm communicating, I must distinguish between permanence versus impermanence. And this is valuable. This is how we learn. But also, you need to be able to read between the lines, go meta and to transcend this and look at the thing that my finger is pointing at, not just look at my finger. So yes, even though I'm talking about the difference between permanence versus impermanence, ultimately you have to recognize that these are going to come together and they're going to go full circle and they're actually going to be identical. So here's the paradox of it. On the one hand, we have Maya, Samsara, or the world of form, as the Hindus and Buddhists refer to it. This is the relative domain of all the human stuff that we do. This is all impermanent. On the other hand, we have the Godhead, emptiness, nothingness, formlessness, nirvana. This is the permanent true self, we might say. This is the thing you think that we're going to move you towards as you're doing this work and you're awakening and you're liberating yourself, right? You're going here. This is supposedly enlightenment. But true enlightenment is when you realize that these two things are really identical. Maya and samsara is nirvana. Form is formlessness. And that's what the highest Buddhist and Hindu teachings teach you, is precisely that. But that takes not just one awakening to realize. That takes multiple awakenings. Because in your first awakening, what you're going to realize is the distinction between maya and nirvana between form and formlessness. Your first awakenings will be you moving out of form into formlessness. And that's going to be a huge epiphany for you because for the first time you'll discover that not everything is form. There is something beyond form. Formlessness. The Godhead. And that will be amazing. But there's still going to be a duality between the two in your mind and you're still not going to be fully awake until you awaken even deeper and you realize that, ah, but this formlessness, what is this distinction between formlessness and form? Ah, that also is a relative imaginary construction which must also collapse. And then you have the full unification to the point where you realize that nirvana is not someplace that I go to to escape this, this place here, but you realize that this place here is nirvana and has been nirvana the whole time. And that God is not somewhere out there far away from the mundane world, but that God is the mundane world. This is God right here. I can't reach God because God is everywhere already. That's total oneness. So really in this work, you're realizing oneness at more deeper and deeper or higher and higher levels, however you want to look at it. Now, another thing that I'm commonly accused of when I talk about these kinds of ideas is, well, Leo, aren't you just stealing ideas from Buddhism and then pretending like you're saying something profound? But really, this, Leo, this is just Buddhism. The Buddha already said this. You're just copying him. You have to be careful here because not everything boils down to Buddhism. Buddhism is just one way to frame things. And Buddhism nor the Buddha had a monopoly on the truth. The Buddha was not the first awoken person in the world, uh, nor the best, nor the most. Get this silly idea out of your mind. Before the Buddhists, there were Hindus, <laughs> and before the Hindus, there were others. So, you know, the Hindus also like to say that, oh, well, Leo, this is just all Hinduism. You're just copying Advaita or something. No, I'm not copying anybody per se. Of course, I do read and, and take ideas from different places. Sure, and there's a lot to be gained from Buddhism and from Hinduism and so forth, but don't get, don't get caught on these traditions. Long before there was Buddhism or Hinduism, mankind has known about this stuff. All cultures have basically derived this independently in one fashion or another for themselves. In South America, in North America, in Africa, they knew about this stuff. The aboriginals in Australia, they know about this stuff because they've been using psychedelics for, for tens of thousands of years, and they've been doing spiritual practices, and they've been meditating, and they've been contemplating, and they've been doing dark room retreats, and going into caves, and doing spiritual quests, and vision quests, and doing this, and starving themselves, and going through all sorts of ascetic practices, doing this stuff. 
this truth is not of human origin. See? So it's not that one tradition is copying another tradition. It's that we're all really kind of deriving it independently for ourselves. A new, every generation derives it anew, and it has to be this way. It can't be a tradition. Truth can't be a tradition. Truth must be derived right now from the present moment. In the same way, when you're doing a mathematical proof, for example, when you're, you know, you're doing the Pythagorean theorem proof, and you're like reasoning through it, and you're trying to see like, well, like, a squared plus B squared equals C squared. Why is that? Because there's like, you can kind of draw the little squares and you can add them all up and see that they're the same. When you're doing that, every new generation of humans who does that, they have to reason through it for themselves. They can't just take Pythagoras's word. You can't just go into a book from 2000 years ago, you know, dig up some dusty Pythagorean book, or read what Pythagoras wrote and then just say, okay, I agree with Pythagoras. Pythagoras invented this. By the way, Pythagoras did not invent the Pythagorean theorem. It, it existed long before him. The ancient Egyptians and so forth, they knew about this stuff. The Babylonians and the Sumerians and so forth, they knew about all this stuff. The Pythagorean theorem. Um, uh, so, you know, it's funny that even the Pythagorean theorem is not really uh, the work of, the original work of Pythagoras. So, so don't, get, don't get too clingy and attached to various kinds of traditions and so forth. It's just, you know, the, the whole point of truth is that it's totally democratic. Anybody can access it at any time. And in fact, you must. You must access it for yourself as though for the first time, as though you're the first human who's ever accessed it. That's the only way that you can access the deepest stuff that I talk about. Because it's right here, right now. It's not found in the words of, of humans. It's not found in books. Right here, right now is where you find it. That's how truth works. We're pulling from the same source, right? It's sort of like if you go to Egypt and you ask them, does the sun exist? They'll say yes. And if you go to Japan and you ask them, does the sun exist? They'll say yes. And if you go to Africa, they'll also say yes. Why is that? Is it because the Egyptians invented the sun? No, because the sun is universal to every creature living on this planet. And so they all... Uh, recognize the sun because it's so obvious. So that's exactly how impermanence works. If you just observe reality for a little bit, even as a child, you realize, oh yeah, everything's changing all the time. Pretty obvious. Not rocket science here. So now let's talk about what you can do about impermanence. How do you apply this wisdom? It's not good enough for you just to know about impermanence intellectually. You must deeply observe impermanence and practice in your own life. Otherwise, nothing I say here will really stick. It will just go in one ear and out the other. And that's basically true of everything I say and teach. Train your mind that everything fades. Observe how you cling and how this clinging to permanence, trying to freeze reality, how this causes suffering for you. You need to actually observe yourself doing this at a micro level. Also, observe how others cling and the kind of calamities and suffering that this causes. Observe how people on the television cling. Observe how politicians cling to their power. Observe how wealthy millionaires and celebrities cling to their fame and to their wealth and how this ends up actually leading to their downfall. And gradually surrender more and more attachments. This is a process that will take you years to do. It's not something you accomplish in a week. So here are some of your action steps. Write some of this down. Do not leave this as an abstraction. You must start to observe impermanence every single day. You must practice it like meditation. So here's your homework assignment. For the next week, you're going to observe impermanence every single day at a micro level. At a micro level, you're going to notice how everything is changing all the time. Your experiences, what you're feeling in your body. Right now, maybe you have an itch on your face and then in five minutes it's gone. Right now, maybe you feel comfortable sitting here and then in five minutes you start to feel uncomfortable. Notice that. Maybe you're scared, you're in fear right now because of something someone said to you. 
Notice that and notice that in an hour later, your fear is gone and now you have anger. And then you have anger for 15 minutes and the anger goes away and now you feel horny and then you feel horny for 15 minutes, you jerk off and now you're not horny anymore and you're satisfied and you're meditating or doing something else. Notice this at a very granular micro level. And notice yourself wanting to cling to a state like you're having some pleasure and you want to keep that pleasure for as long as possible. Well, let that go. Like when you're eating some food, notice the food. It tastes really good, but then also let it go rather than trying to get more and more of that food. Like you, you take a few bites of ice cream and then just let it go rather than having to eat the entire fucking carton. Try to enjoy the impermanence, savor in it, bask in the impermanence. Notice that like, yeah, now this ice cream tastes good, but also it's good to just let it go and to not have that ice cream in my mouth. That also is good. And then notice that difference between the two and how that actually makes the ice cream what it is, makes it better. See, do this very mindfully with a lot of precision and awareness. And it would help for you to have some sort of meditation practice in order to be able to do this. And as you do this, notice how you start to appreciate little things more. Little things that come up for you, you start to now appreciate. Whereas normally, your default tendency would be to try to like structure your entire day in order to cling to some sort of source of pleasure or stimulation or excitement or something like that. Whereas here, now, now you're not structuring your day to get some sort of big juicy payoff, like a hit of heroin in your veins. <laughs> it's not that. Now you structure your day more loosey-goosey and you're just, you're, you're more spontaneous and you're just willing to go and roll with the punches of the day, the ups and downs. You're able to sort of enjoy the, the positives and negatives. You're able to enjoy the peaks and the exciting moments and also the quiet moments. Get a wristband like this, stick it on your wrist <clears throat> like this, and this will be your reminder for the next week. Every time you notice this with your eye, <clears throat> catches your eye, remember to pause for a few seconds and to remember that you're doing this exercise of trying to notice the impermanence. And you should start to notice that as you do this more, every moment becomes more precious and more special. And this is the essence of true happiness. This is what true happiness is. Not the kind of chasing of pleasure that you typically do. <clears throat> and this is the essence of spirituality. Notice that spirituality is the opposite of wishful thinking, the way that people commonly misconceive spirituality as being. You know, there, there, there's this myth in popular culture that, oh, spiritual people are just the ones who are brainwashed, they're the ones who are like those hippie new agers who just want to be positive about everything. You know, they want to engage in positive thinking. They want to fill their mind with fantasies about how they're going to, you know, live forever and all of this. But it's exactly the opposite. True spirituality is facing the brutal nature, confronting aware, confronting impermanence, and training yourself to notice it and to let it go and to roll with the flow. That's true spirituality. In fact, it's the scientifically minded people who are wishful thinkers, who don't want to face the truth. For example, somebody like Ray Kurzweil, who has this ridiculous idea, this fantasy really, of, of this technological singularity where in the next 50 years, we will build computers and Ray Kurzweil will just be able to plug in his brain and upload himself into a computer and live forever. This is, this is, this is an absurd fantasy that he has. He will never attain immortality in this way. The irony is that immortality is right here, right now, if only he would give up on that fucking technological fantasy of his and start practicing spirituality. So it's exactly the opposite of what many skeptics and atheists and scientists think. 
they are the ones who are living in fantasy land. You're never going to achieve any kind of technological immortality because technology is form. All form is impermanent. This is fundamental to the very structure of existence. And the sooner you can realize that, the better. Not as a dogma. I'm not telling you to accept this as an ideological tenet of your worldview. I'm saying you got to become conscious of this, directly conscious of this. And then you'll really be able to appreciate what life is. All right, that's it. I'm done for this one. Please click that like button for me and come check out actualize.org. That is my website. I do have a website that has additional free exclusive content on it. So do use that resource. Some people, you know, they, they only watch me on YouTube and they never even bother to click on the website. You'll find my blog there where I post exclusive content and insights. You can find the book list there. You can find uh, my life purpose course there. You can find the actualized forum there where you can ask questions and chat with people who are into this work, which is pretty rare because most of your friends aren't doing this work. And the final thing I'll say here to wrap it all up is this. Sometimes people fall into this trap of thinking like, well, Leo, isn't all this philosophy? You're just wasting a bunch of time talking about philosophy. How is this going to help my life? But your very desire to skip over philosophy, to manipulate your life, to get a little bit of pleasure and happiness and money and whatever else you want, sex and so forth, that very tendency is the very problem, you see, of why your life is not as good as it could be. What your life is lacking is depth. Depth. You're living life at such a shallow level. One of the most important things I'm doing with my work is I'm trying to introduce you to the depth of life. And that's something that you don't see in most places on YouTube, other websites, even within the self-help industry. Rarely do you see people, teachers and so forth, introducing you to the full depth of what life is. Life is a very, very deep thing. It's amazing. It's infinitely deep. It's also infinitely wide. So that's what we're trying to show you with this work. At times, it will seem like it's just philosophy, it's just abstractions and ideas, and it can't possibly change anything, and it doesn't have any real-world consequences. Well, that's because you're not doing the work, and also because you're not patient enough takes patience. Depth and breadth takes patience. It might take you a few years of, of listening to this stuff just to start to realize the significance of what's really being said. And you haven't even maybe convinced yourself yet to even start to do the homework yet, to do the practices. You're not even there yet. It'll take you a few years just to get there. Then you start maybe doing the practices because you realize that, oh, maybe there's something here. And then you do that and then you start to see the payoff a few years later from that. And then, you know, it builds, it all builds, it snowballs. This is a sort of a slow burn process. This is not a sprint. This is a marathon that we're running here together. And I've told you this from the very beginning. If you've been following me for five years or even more that I've been releasing this content, you know, this was the intent from the very beginning. I knew from the very beginning of releasing my first video that there was so much stuff that I wanted to put out there, so many profound topics and ideas, but it's taken years, literally, it's taken over five years to build myself up to the point where I could share this stuff at the, at the level and quality that I'm satisfied with now. And still, there's, there's much that I haven't shared with you. I'm only able to share maybe five or 10% of everything that I want to share with you because it's just too much. It's too much. It's too much work to organize all this stuff. It, it hurts my brain <laughs> to talk about all this stuff so much. You know, it's too much to explain. And it's, it's too much for you to process and to take in. You're going to have to literally uh, work on this content for years. Watch my videos for years in order to get the full juice of what's here. But this is the best way, uh, not waste, but use of your time. 
if you're concerned about wasting your time, what you should be concerned about is all the other stuff you're doing in your life when you're not listening to this depth of content. Compare the depth of content and conversations that we have together through these videos with everything else that's happening in your life. I guarantee you nothing else is going to be as deep as this. Not your time with your family or your friends or at work or the books you read or the YouTube videos you watch. Nothing is going to be this deep. See? And this is exactly what you need. You need to be questioning reality at deeper levels. You need to be asking deep questions about yourself, your life, your environment, about society, about politics, about religion, about government, about science. Nobody is asking the deep questions. It's amazing. Nobody's doing it. Why not? Because it's not popular. It's not marketable. It usually doesn't earn people lots of money doing this stuff. I could earn a lot more money by doing shallow stuff, you know, <laughs> I, I have had the idea of just like quitting actualize.org and starting a video game channel because, you know, I could earn a lot more money and frankly, my life would be a lot easier. My job would be a lot easier if I don't have to research all this shit every single week, you know, carefully organize all this stuff and instead just like play fucking Minecraft 40 hours a week, put that shit on Twitch or whatever or stream it on YouTube and earn millions of dollars. I could have done that from the very beginning. But, of course, again, we're playing a much longer, deeper game here than just that. We're interested in getting to the very bottom of reality, exploring its full depth and breadth. And who else is doing that but us? Is TV mainstream news doing it? Is science doing it? Is religion doing it? No, they're not doing it. They're focused on a very little narrow sliver of reality. Even all the spiritual schools, they're focused on this much of reality compared to everything that there is. See? So, don't worry about wasting your time here. This is one of the most valuable uses of your time there can be. But it'll take time for this... for this apple tree to start to bear fruit. You're just, we're planting a seed, you know, the tree needs to grow for a few years, then the fruits will start to grow and will start to fall down, they will shower upon you. Don't let your friends and family and, and other naysayers convince you that somehow watching this content and spending time thinking about this, this is a waste of time. It's exactly the opposite of that. They're the ones, the ones who are accusing you of wasting your time are the ones who are wasting their time. Asking deep questions about life is the best use of one's time in life. What else are you going to do? You got a better idea? If you have a better idea of what you can be doing with your life, instead of watching and thinking about this material, please post it in the comments down below. I'd love to hear your suggestions.